So, first up on, on, uh, on the agenda is House of the Dragon, um, season, season one, the finale last night. Um, what did you think of that? Um, and two, that's one, and the, the part two of that is that I know you had seen a rough cut before, but not the finished version. Right. And I'm wondering, how different are those? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, they're considerably different. You know, I, I mean, I've worked in television film quite a while, so it's mm -hmm. not, I've seen rough cuts before, but, um, you know, if, uh, it, it, the special effects, color timing, sound adjustment, mm -hmm. all of these things make a, a huge difference. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, seeing the big uh, dragon battle that was the highlight of last night's thing, mm -hmm. In a rough cut is kind of uh, 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 yeah not not quite the same right. as that amazing sequence they did last night yeah. with the storm and the you know the dragons appearing and disappearing in the clouds and uh, you know that that's the magic of special effects the magic of cinematography and it, it's uh, considerably considerably different yeah although my favorite um, <coughs> I saw many of the episodes in a rough cut ahead of time. Do you remember the, uh, um, I think it was episode three where the king went hunting? Hmm. And he was hunting for a, a, a white heart. And uh, they, they find right. a heart, which is not actually white. Um, but he, he deals with that heart. Um, well, in the rough cut, the part of the heart was played by two stuntmen in, in uh, bright blue costumes, the blue man group, uh, sort of. One of them was uh, <laughs> holding the other one around the waist. And, uh, you know, the king is stabbing at them with his head. So the king is hunting the blue man group. Um, it was hilarious when you uh, saw it. But, of course, by the time it was finished, wow. it was a beautiful, realistic-looking art. So you have to get used to, if you work in this business, uh, yeah. to know what, uh, what a rough cut is and, yeah. and uh, be able to visualize what the final version would be. Amazing. I mean, do you ever think we could... There could be a special where we get to see some of these rough cuts, like they did for Lord of the Rings and stuff like that. Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I think they may, um, at some point, do uh, you know a, a Blu-ray, uh, a DVD, and when they do that, they often add special features. Now, what kind of special features they add? Well, they there are deleted scenes in many of the episodes, so we could add back the deleted mm. scenes. And that's something mm. that uh, they frequently like to do. Right. Sometimes there are blooper reels where actors walk into a wall or they forget the line or they do something uh, similar. Um, you know, you could add something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they would do the, the Blue Man group, though. I think the special effects wizards like to, like magicians. They like, don't, don't want to reveal their tricks. Okay. Yeah, they, they like, to, <laughs> like to keep that secret. Right. And uh, the episode itself and, and how it wraps up the first season. Oh. Uh, it's... it's uh, of course, we've been working this for on, on a long time, so I knew where we were going, where we would wrap mm -hmm. up the season. But uh, yeah, I think it did it very powerfully, uh, very powerfully. And uh, now we just have to do it again for season two, yeah. which is uh, also a challenge because everything gets bigger and more characters come into play. And um, we, we switch to more locations. I mean, the first season we were pretty much King's Landing, yeah. Dragonstone, Driftmark were the main locations. Occasionally we went to the Stepstones uh, for a little battle and dragon action or mm -hmm. to Storm's End, but mostly it was centered on that. But now, as things get serious, you'll be going to uh, you know, other locations, uh, King, um, Winterfell and the Starks and uh, you know, possibly um, the Riverlands, Harrenhal, um, all of these uh, places will be seen more uh, families and dragons will come into it and it just gets bigger. Uh, so. And you're saying all this, but we have to wait, wait to see that. Sadly, <laughs> yes, you have to wait. You have to probably have to wait until uh, 2024 because I don't think this show is so big. I don't think we can mm. have it ready uh, next year in 2023. You know, it came on in August. So mm -hmm. ideally we would, the new season would come on in August of a year later, but it's too big. We can't right. do it that. Now, it may not be a full two years. Maybe come 2024, we'll be able to bring it on in like April or May instead of August, but uh, I don't think it's much chance it's going to be before that. Right. 
Well, I thoroughly enjoyed the show um, and watched a number of episodes twice. And, and then just, just the other day, my wife and I went back to, um, to, the, to the first season, uh, to the first episode. Um, and I felt like, wow, we have been through a lot. I mean, I guess it's the years passing and all the events. It was almost like I was being reminded that this journey, it had been quite a journey, basically, even though it's not, uh, it's not particularly far flung. Um, but in rewatching them, I, I recommend it to folks. Um, the, the episodes, I think each one gets, gets better as I, as I rewatch it. Um, Were you uh, troubled by the uh, time jumps and the, the castings, as, as some people say they were? I wouldn't say troubled. Um, it, it, the feeling is this, that I wish that we could have spent more time with everything. Um, and, and yeah, and seeing some of the, 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 the relationships develop there. Um, so I would have loved for it to be, to be slower. But that's not like, I'm not really troubled because I also respect and, understand and can see the decision making process that went into, into, into those choices. Yeah, How about it's, you? It, it's always <laughs> an interesting uh, question. I mean, you know, may, you may have to deal with it yourself someday. I mean, it, your Hannibal novel, for example, mm -hmm. what if they made a, a feature film of Hannibal or a TV series? It's in development. I mean, he, has a, TV. he has a yeah. long life. Where, where do you begin it? Did you have little child Hannibal? Does he grow up, or do you already have him being fully fleshed, going forth to battle mm -hmm. in, I guess, Spain initially? Yeah, yeah and uh, winning that and invading Italy, but that took years. You campaigned Dang. in Italy for like a decade or something like that, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, it's and, and a long time period. Then yeah. he got called back to, to fight the Battle of Zama, mm -hmm. and uh, then he had to run away and he lived in exile for a while. How, how do you present all that? What format do you uh, do? You do? Um, and it's a challenge. Um, so anything that's a, a lengthy period of time, I think you have your, your choice where to begin it, and uh, if there are things that come before it, do you present them in dialogue, do you present them in terms of flashbacks or dreams, or do you do the chronological thing and let the years pass, and which does occasionally call for recasting. Yeah, yeah. As, as I watched, watched the show, um, I was impressed again and again by when a decision, by, by the decisions that needed to be made, like kind of again and again each episode, um, I could see that um, it was all quite deliberate. You might lose something over here, but you're, but you're gaining something over there. What do you think, you know, maybe time jumps aside, were some of the hardest decisions to make in, in, in approaching the show? Well, I mean, the hardest decision uh, to, to make was uh, the one I've just alluded to mm -hmm. is is where to begin. I mean, history is continuous. A Fire and Blood, well, both books actually, even this one longer than that one, um, present the, the history of the Targaryen dynasty, largely starting with any detail in Aegon's conquest, um, which is when Aegon the Conqueror and his two sisters mm -hmm. started taking over Westeros. Now, actually, th there's history before that, um, you know, Aenor the Exile and his daughter Daenys the Dreamer, who so foresaw the doom of Valyria, came to Westeros and, and moved into Dragonstone like a century earlier. And then they, they had children and they died and the children became the lords. And you know there was a number of generations <laughs> that are listed there, but I don't go into any detail about them right. until I get to Aegon and uh, Visenya and Rhaenys and their three dragons. Um, and then there's, you know, there's Aegon's conquest. You know, we could have begun then. We could have begun, uh, you know, with, with Aegon and not even reached the Dance of the Dragons for, you know, five seasons yeah. or something because you, there's a lot of history is continuous. One of the things that uh, inspired uh, me to do Fire and Blood um, mm. was a, a popular history book that I read way back in the 50s uh, by Thomas B. Custain, uh, who was a very popular historical novelist of the period. Um, and he mostly wrote historical fiction, but he did write a four-volume history of the Plantagenets. And uh, it, it starts from the beginning of the Plantagenet family, and it goes all the way through the, uh, the end of the Plantagenet, <laughs> which was the, the Wars of the Roses, right. when they were exterminated by the, uh, the Tudors. Um, so that's one way to do things. I mean, history just goes on and on. We, we, we see these, uh, these shows, um, movies, 
television shows, books that have a have a beginning, a middle, and end. Uh, okay, here's a book about William the Conqueror, and it's like William the Conqueror is born, William the Conqueror dies. But no, he's part of a you know there was someone before William the Conqueror. He had a father, he had a mother. Where did they come from? They had a father and mother. And after William the Conqueror died, there are more things. There's all the stories of his children. <coughs> so, and who gets to be king after him? Um, so that was the big challenge. Right. Now, we knew around 2016, it became clear that uh, Game of Thrones was, was going to end um, probably with seven seasons, as it happened with seven grew and it became eight. But um, at that point, HBO sort of said, well, what do we, we, we need a, a new show. And I pitched them two shows. One of them was uh, the uh, Dunkin' Egg show, which uh, they didn't, didn't pick up on, but I pitched them the Dance of the Dragons, which I already knew about, I'd already written about mm -hmm. to some extent um, in some novellas and in the World of Ice and Fire history book, um, another illustrated coffee table yeah, book like that. that. And they liked that, so uh, we, were, we were going with uh, the Dance of the Dragons, and we've been developing it um, you know, since 2016 okay. in one form or another. <coughs> um, there were a couple of the writers on the show before Ryan Condal um, came on, and Ryan, of course, has done an amazing job. But w one of the big issues with all of these writers was where to begin. Yeah. Where to begin? Do you begin with Aegon's Conquest? That's a long time ago. Do you begin with, uh, you, well, you saw the show, you saw where Ryan began, mm -hmm. and I think he made a, a great choice. He mm -hmm. began in 101 with the Great Council, where the Lords vote that Jaehaerys is heir. He's just lost his son Balon, who has died of appendicitis. So who is his heir now? And they choose, the Lords vote to choose Viserys over Rainies. Um And then you immediately skip forward. It's just that one prologue scene, and then you skip forward to skip over Jaehaerys' death, mm -hmm. skip over yeah, all that. Yeah. Viserys has been in power for a number of years, and you pick it up with the tournament, the conflict with uh, Daemon, the, the birth of uh, his male heir, and of course it, it turns into a horror when his wife Emma, Queen Emma, dies and the child dies um, a day later, and Rhaenyra is declared heir. You, you recall all of that. Oh, from yeah. <laughs> I do indeed. <coughs> but I don't know if I should reveal this. Maybe I should wait for a, uh, a Blu-ray or something after the show. But that was not you know, handed down by uh, um, some, <laughs> some muse from ancient Greece. Uh, we, myself and the other writers, had uh, a lot of spirited discussions about where to uh, where to begin that story. One of the writers wanted to begin it uh, later, wanted to begin it essentially with Emma dying. So skip the Great Council, hmm. skip the tournament, a scream sounds out, Emma right. is dead. Right. That's where you begin. Um, so that was one possibility. Uh, and another uh, of the writers wanted to be, and even later than that, to begin with Viserys dying. So you open Act One, Scene One, Viserys is, uh, and what happens there? Well, then you have to present all that material in flashbacks or yeah. dialogue. That becomes challenging too. Um, but we discussed all these possibilities, and the other possibility we discussed, which was actually my favorite possibility, but nobody liked it except me. Um, <laughs> I would have began it much earlier. I would have began it like 40 years earlier, with an episode I would have called The Heir and the Spare, in which Jaehaerys' two sons, Aemon and Balon, are alive. And we see the friendship, but also the rivalry between the two uh, sides of the, of the great house. And then, you know, Aemon dies accidentally when a, when a, Dorn, uh, a uh, Mirish crossbowman shoots him by accident. Um, on Tarth, and then Jaehaerys has to decide who becomes the new heir. Is it the daughter of the older son who's just died, or is it the second son who's only, you know, has children of his own and is a man and she's just a teenage girl? You know, all of that stuff. So you could have presented all of that stuff, but then you would have had 40 more years, and you would have <laughs> even more time jumps, and you would have even more recastings, 
And uh, yeah, I was the only one who was really enthused about that. Uh, uh, so I don't know, but I, I, I've always loved uh, the poetry of Rudyard Kipling, and uh, I, I love his uh, poem, In the Neolithic Age, where the refrain is there. There are nine and sixty ways of constructing tribal lays, and every single one of them is right. And I think that's true for writing books or television shows. There are many ways you can approach these things, and if you do it well, it, it can work. <laughs>